Church of Rochester, and thank you for joining me online for this Good Friday message. Uh, today we celebrate and remember what the Lord did on the cross. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to Ch Luke chapter 22. And before we get started, please bow your head for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the time that you have given us to gather together to remember what you did on the cross. Thank you for giving us opportunity to remember and examine scripture of the sacrifice that you made on the cross. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak tonight. Lord, I pray that you would be able to convict us, be able to teach us, to encourage us. But Lord, I pray that your name will be glorified and we pray all this in the name of Jesus, amen. Tonight, I wanna bring you to the Garden of Gethsemane. This garden was on the western slope of the Mount of Olives, and this word Gethsemane means olive press. This place was not a strange place to Jesus and his disciples. It is recorded in John 18:2 that this place, this garden, was where Jesus and his disciples gathered regularly. In Luke 22, in our passage tonight, starting in verse 41 and 42, it says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, at this moment, Jesus knew that his departure to the cross was about to begin. His departure to the cross was approaching. Jesus knew that he soon would be enduring a torturous process. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. The word cup in Luke twenty two forty two 42 refers to the wrath associated with God's judgment of Jesus on the cross. Jesus would take the sins of the world upon himself and endure the wrath and judgment of God on our behalf. Jesus knew the wrath to come. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We serve a living and powerful God who yielded and surrendered his will to the Father. You see, as believers of the King of Kings, we must yield our will to the Father. I wanna challenge you tonight. Have you yielded to God in your life? Are there areas that you don't allow God to take? There are some areas that you're willing to give, but some that you're not willing to give over to Christ. Jesus Christ is the prime example of how we must push our agendas aside. We must place our plans for life aside and examine ourselves if God is really directing our lives. If God is really directing and letting us go in a path that he wants to do, or are we making all the decisions, all the plans in our life? John 5, 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but that what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he do doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus was subject to the Father. Jesus Christ marched to the beat of a completely different worldview. John 6, 39 through 40 says this, and this is the Father's will, which hath sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should rise up again on the, at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. See, Jesus followed the will of God. He was only interested in walking in the direction of the Father. And because of his obedience, Jesus was in opposition to society. He was in opposition to the culture of the day. And as Christians, as we follow Christ, we will walk against cultural norms. 
We will walk against social trends as saints, as Christians. Our only path in life is to follow the will of the Father. Luke 22, verse 43 to 45, says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. In Luke twenty two forty one says that Jesus knelt down and prayed. He knelt down and prayed. Our Savior was preparing himself. Scripture informs us that during this prayer, an angel appeared to him, appeared to Jesus and, and strengthened him. He was passionately praying. He was praying in agony. He, he yet, through his agony, he prayed more earnestly. In Luke twenty two forty three, we read that, and when he rose up from prayer. You see, rising up from prayer, prayer meant that Jesus was in prayer. Jesus rose up strengthened. Jesus rose up renewed as he connected with his Father in heaven. Church, I encourage you. Church, I encourage you to look to Jesus as an example of prayer. To make it common in your life. To make it common in my life to kneel down in prayer. When we kneel down and pray like Jesus, God will strengthen you. We are living in a world that is searching for hope. We are in a li we're living in a time where many are scared, many are afraid. People are grasping and reaching for something that will bring them some kind of assurance or some kind of hope or some kind of relief from the present stress or the present dire situation. As Christians, our assurance and our hope is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, as he was preparing himself to the cross, Jesus was in communion with the Father. In my life, there have been numerous times where I have been discouraged and left without hope. There are many times where I, I felt anxious and, and, and many times where I felt that as if nothing could happen to relieve my stress. But during those moments, I knelt down in prayer and I communed with the Father. During those times, I, I didn't know if, if God could change the situation right away in a miracle. But I knelt down and pray, prayed to the Father and I told him his, all my troubles. I, I told him my struggles and, and when I rose up and when I rise up from prayer, even though my situation or struggle has not been altered or changed, I rise up with renewed hope. I rise up with new encouragement. You see, on Good Friday, we remember the example that Jesus did. We, we remember the example that Jesus did for us as he prepared himself to the cross, as he prepared himself in, in communion with the Father, knowing what was going to happen, knelt down and prayed. He, he knelt down to commune with the Father, and then after his prayer and communion with the, with the Father, he was left strengthened. Church, we uh, are in need for strength. We're in need of a hope and encouragement in all of our lives. No matter what, situation or no matter where you find yourself tonight, we are all in need of hope. And that hope is found in Jesus. On Good Friday, we remember the painful journey that Jesus took to the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was betrayed by one of his own, Judas. What is interesting about Judas is that this apostle was hand chosen by Jesus it wasn't as if someone gave him Judas or someone uh, called in a favor for them to be part or for Judas to be part of the 12 disciples. No, Jesus chose the 12. These are the ones that he had picked. Judas also received the same training as, as all the other apostles. He witnessed the, the miracles that Jesus performed throughout his whole ministry. Three years of ministry, Judas had a front view, he had a front row of, of Jesus not only teaching, 
but also performing these miracles. He received the power. He received power to heal sick, as we read in Scripture. Jesus, uh, Judas was set up for success. He was given all the tools to do as the other apostles did, to succeed in following after, God, uh, after Christ and succeeding in, in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was set up to do everything he was supposed to do, given all the tools, given all the teaching. He was personally discipled by Jesus himself and he saw Christ daily. But Judas in the end decided to go his own way. Even though he was set up and, and given all these uh, things, uh, resources, and, him, and Jesus himself, and uh, being able to be in ministry with Jesus, Judas decided to go a different way. Uh, he, he decided to follow his own will. He followed his own plans, and it led him away from the Savior. Church, when we decide to do our own things, when we decide that we have more wisdom than God himself and more wisdom than Scripture, we will find ourselves away from God. We will find ourselves away from Christ and not following him, but away from him when we decide things on our own. He followed his own plans and it led him away. A.T. Robinson said this, Judas evidently opened the door of his heart and let Satan in. Then Satan took a charge and he became a devil, as Jesus said. You see, at one point, Judas even complained about Ma what Mary of Bethany did to Jesus. If you remember the passage, Mary poured out a very precious ointment on Jesus and an act of worship. But Judas complained that she should have sold this ointment, this very ointment that she used, Judas thought that she should have sold this ointment, which was equal to a year's wages and the money given to the poor. Yet Judas was willing to give up Jesus for far less, 30 pieces of silver. You see, this was, in Judas's life, he began a pattern of, of doing things on his own. He was set up in the most perfect spiritual environment led by the Savior, yet he decided his own way. Church, when we think that we have more wisdom or we see a different route that may look better, if we haven't consulted God, we cannot move forward. We cannot go in any direction without allowing and going to God, seeing where he has us to go. Asking the Lord if it's his will. Mimicking the example of Jesus in the garden. That Jesus wanted to follow the Father's will. When Jesus was arrested, he would endure six trials. Three before the Jewish religious authorities and three before the civil authorities of Rome. And, and what we find is all these trials were illegal. Every single one of these trials through these trials, one law after another were broken. Through these trials, he was brought before Herod. He was brought before Pilate. Peter, the self-appointed leader of the disciples, denied him three times. Throughout these, these trials, Jesus was slapped. He, he was blindfolded and punched. He was mocked. An innocent man was given a guilty verdict. In Matthew 27, 14, Jesus was being questioned by Pilate. And Jesus remained silent, not attempting to defend himself, not attempting to uh, bring any defense towards himself. Matthew 27, 14 says, and he answered him to never a word in it so much that the governor marveled greatly. Philippians 2, 7 through 9, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him name which is above every name. We see countless examples as we uh, cel celebrate and remember Good Friday, what Jesus did as he 
came and journeyed to the cross and died on the cross for our sins. We see that there was always a pattern of an examples, one example after another. And the example we see here in Philippians 2, 7 through 9, and through these illegal trials and, and, and mockings and scourgings and beatings, is that Jesus remained humbled. And not only that, he humbled himself to the will of the Father, but he was obedient. He was obedient unto death, obedient even if everything around him seemed to be caving in. Even though everything that was around him accusing him as him as a criminal, Jesus didn't defend himself, but he was obedient to the call of the Father. The church, we must be obedient to the call of the Father. We have to ask ourselves where the Lord is leading us, where, what ministries he wants us to be involved in, uh, what, what part of the church he wants us to serve in. We all have ministry in our lives, and we must be cognitive. We must be aware that God himself has called us to serve. And he, Jesus himself, was obedient unto death. He humbled himself. Church, we must humble ourselves going forward in whatever God has called us to do. If you don't know what God has called you to do or what he has you to do in, in, in your life, please ask the Father. Search and examine your own heart where God wants you to be, wants you to serve. Maybe you're in a, a direction that you're away from God. Maybe you've been set up for success. Your parents have, have brought you to church. They, they brought you everything that you need to be successful in the spiritual life, but yet you've decided to go the other way. Uh, may I, I pray that you would see that you have been away from the Savior to come back to him. He humbled himself. When Jesus was returned to Pilate, he gave the Jewish authorities and the crowd a choice to free one individual. The choice between a, a notorious criminal named Barabbas or to release Jesus. That was, that was the choice. Barabbas or Jesus. John 18, 40 says, then cried all day again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. Yet the mob chose to release a criminal instead of the Son of God. The mob were filled with evil. They were evil people on an evil agenda led by an evil individual. That, his name is Satan. Our world today is headed towards the same scenario. The mob hates and opposes the truth. The cultural and social mob yells and screams to make that which is evil to be called good and that which is good to be called evil. Our society, this world, and specifically the mob in our country, Romans 1.24 says, Wherefore God has also given, gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts and to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. God is giving up people to themselves, to their own wickedness. And we see that today in our society that the mob is crying out more and more against the truth. And this mob is gaining attention this cultural mob is, is anti-Christ, it's anti-church, it's anti-religious, it's anti-Jesus, everything against what the Bible stands for. We see in Romans 1 that God eventually gives these people up to themselves to, for them to fulfill their evil. We also see that Pilate then ordered Jesus to be beaten. The mob ruled and they won. What Jesus endured, I believe many of us miss. But what the mob didn't know was this was the plan of the Father. The graphic nature of Jesus enduring his journey to the cross and on the cross is unfathomable, and, and the reality of the scourging that took place is just uh, something that we can't recreate. Scourging involved using a whip, the whip had long leather straps that oftentimes included bits of sheep bone braided into the straps. 
in the Journal of, uh, of the American Medical Association published in 1986 states this, the iron balls would cause deep contusions and the leather thongs and sheep bones would cut into the skin and tissues. Then as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeleton muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. The scourging that Jesus endured on our behalf only begins the suffering. You see, a medical doctor, also Dr. Frederick, in his book, The Crucifixion of Jesus, said, rib fractures and severe lung bruises and lacerations with bleeding into the chest cavity and partial or complete collapse of the lung. You see, with all this, the Romans knew exactly what they were doing. They were experts in their field. They were absolutely merciless with Jesus. The scourging became a humiliating and torturous spectacle. After the scourging, Jesus was once again brought before the mob and completely humiliated as they forced a crown of thorns on his head and robe around his body, uh, all in the attempt to mock him. John 19, four through six says, Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus and forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto him, behold the man. When the chief priests were therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Paul, Pilate saith unto him, Take ye and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Pilate was forced to release a notorious criminal and condemn an innocent man to death. Jesus was sent to be crucified. Scripture does not describe the crucifixion. All the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all very limited in their detail. Only three words in Greek and only four words in English. There they crucified him. Crucifixion was the common day in, in the day of Jesus. Some commentators write that there were about 30,000 people that were crucified during this time. The gospel did not include the details. Their audiences knew very well what occurred. Uh, their audiences knew exactly what took place and all the things that would be included in someone that was crucified. The ancient orator Cicero described the crucifixion as the worst extreme of the tortures inflicted upon slaves. Chuck Swindle, in his book, Jesus, the Greatest Life of All, wrote this. They stripped him completely naked again to heighten the shame and pushed his back down onto the cross. One soldier lay across his chest and another across his legs while two others stretched out his arms and drove a five inch long, three eighths inch square nail through each hand. They bent his knees and placed his feet flat against the stripe and drove a nail through each foot. The soldiers then tilted the cross up and guided the base into a hole. The cross suddenly stood vertically and then fell to the bottom with a jarring thud. As they drove wedges between the beam and the sides of the hole to keep the cross firmly upright, Jesus offered a quiet prayer. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. You see, this is what Jesus did us did on our behalf. This is what he did for us. In Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have, have been are dead in our trespasses and sin before a holy God. And this was necessary to, to pay the penalty, the wrath of God, to, 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 to pay the penalty to the Lord because of sin that was on this earth. And we are all guilty of committing sin, completely guilty. And the only thing that would satisfy the Lord's wrath because of sin would be this payment of a sinless Savior. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Good Friday represents that, uh, the wages of death. We are representations, we are born into sin, and without God, we only can find sin. But Romans 6.23 continues, 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Through the Lord's sacrifice, through his journey to the cross, we know that the penalty of sin was paid. Our sins were nailed to the cross. And an innocent man who was perfect, spotless, died on the cross on our behalf. Tonight I want to stop and make a bold statement. I want to make it very clear to what I say next. The cross made all the difference. His blood that was shed made the difference. His body that was broken and beaten made the difference. Through the death of, of Jesus, he placed all of our sins, all the punishment that we were owed and we deserve on to himself and in, in eternal damnation in hell, God took that all on the cross and Jesus said, it is finished. Those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, those who call upon Christ will be forgiven of their sins and those who receive the gift of salvation because of the sacrifice that was done on the cross. I love what Isaiah 53, 7 says. It prophesies the crucifixion of Jesus 700 years before this verse says he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, and he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before her, her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. When a Christian realizes all the pain, all the suffering, all the torture Christ endured on their behalf, when a Christian realizes that their sin were, was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross, when a Christian begins to understand that it is by grace that we are saved, it will cause the Christian to worship. You see, on Good Friday here tonight, we remember the Christ. We remember the Savior, the Son of God, his journey to the cross and on that cross paying the penalty that was ours paying the penalty that, that should have been ours and taking that damnation and wrath onto himself so that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. As we remember the cross of Christ tonight, we remember that Good Friday ends with the death of Christ. Jesus was the only didn't journey to the cross and die for our sins. He didn't just go to the cross and having his blood shed for us. Jesus, as he said, it is finished with his own power, with his own will, giving up and dying on the cross. And we see that Good Friday ends as Jesus is placed in the tomb. He's placed in the tomb and three days we see that the scriptures were right. Jesus journeyed to the cross. He died on, this, uh, on that cross for us. His blood was shed and then he was placed in the tomb. But three days later, we do find out what happens. And church, I would like you to join me this Easter, this Sunday, to celebrate what comes next. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we've given us, Lord, to remember what you did for us. For that your journey to the cross, you paying a brutal death on the cross for us. Lord, thank you for this sacrifice. Thank you for your journey to the cross, all the things you have endured, but in the end, you followed the will of the Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, tonight. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. 